Hello and welcome to Connect Week Connection on July 28th, 2023. I'm Pastor Joel. And I'm Pastor Natalie. And we're here at First Presbyterian Church to do um, what we ordinarily do. We do it usually on Wednesdays, but here it is Friday just because sometimes the week gets away from us. But that's okay because God's Word is new every morning and His mercies never come to an end. So uh, we're going to read our daily lectionary texts and talk about it and pray about it. So let's go ahead and open in a word of prayer. Gracious Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to gather today and to read your word. I pray, Lord, that it would sink deeply into our hearts and we would be transformed by it. I know, Lord, it's a crazy world out there, but you are in control. You are a sovereign God and uh, you are calling people to yourself. Help us to be a part of that as we minister and serve others. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Uh, we're going to start today with Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cried to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, so that you may be revered. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning, more than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is great power to redeem. It is he who will redeem Israel from all its iniquities. Psalm 148. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his host. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord. For he commanded and they were created. He established them forever and ever. He fixed their bounds, which cannot be passed. Praise the Lord from the earth, you sea monsters and all deeps. Fire and hail, snow and frost, stormy wind, fulfilling his command mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and all cattle, creeping things and flying birds, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and women alike, old and young together. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His glory is above earth and heaven. He has raised up a horn for his people. Praise for all of his faithful, for the people of Israel who were close to him. Praise the Lord. Our Hebrew scripture reading today comes from 1 Samuel chapter 31, starting in verse 1 and going through verse 13. Now the Philistines fought against Israel, and the men of Israel fled before the Philistines, and many fell on Mount Gilboa. The Philistines overtook Saul and his sons, and the Philistines killed Jonathan and Abinadab and Malchusha the sons of Saul. The battle pressed hard upon Saul. The archers found him, and he was badly wounded by them. Then Saul said to his armor-bearer, Draw your sword and thrust me through with it, so that these uncircumcised may not come and thrust me through and make sport of me. But his armor-bearer was unwilling, for he was terrified. So Saul took his own sword and fell upon it. When his armor-bearer saw that Saul was dead, he also fell upon his sword and died with him. So Saul and his three sons and his armor-bearer and all his men died together on the same day. When the men of Israel who were on the other side of the valley and those beyond the Jordan saw that the men of Israel had fled and that Saul and his sons were dead, they forsook their towns and fled, and the Philistines came and occupied them. The next day, when the Philistines came to strip the dead, they found Saul and his three sons fallen on Mount Gilboa. They cut off his head, stripped off his armor, and sent messengers throughout the land of the Philistines to carry the good news to the houses of their idols and to the people. They put his armor in the temple of Astarte, and they fastened his body to the wall of Beth Shan. But when the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead heard what the Philistines had done to Saul, all the valiant men set out, traveled all night long, and took the body of Saul and the bodies of his sons from the wall of Bethshan. They came to Jabesh and burned them there. 
Then they took their bones and buried them under the tamarisk tree in Jabesh and fasted seven days. And from Acts chapter 15, verses 12 through 21. The whole assembly kept silence and listened to Barnabas and Paul as they told of all the signs and wonders that God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they finished speaking, James replied, My brothers, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first looked favorably on the Gentiles to take from them, take from among them a people for his name. This agrees with the words of the prophets as it is written. After this, I will return and I will rebuild the dwelling of David, which has fallen from its ruins. I will rebuild it and I will set it up so that all the peoples may seek the Lord even all the Gentiles over whom my name has been called. Thus says the Lord, who has been making these things known from long ago. Therefore, I have reached the decision that we should not trouble those Gentiles who are turning to God, but we should write to them to abstain only from things polluted by idols and from fornication and from whatever has been strangled and from blood. For in every city for generations past, Moses has had those who proclaim him for he has been read aloud every Sabbath in the synagogues. Our gospel reading today is from Mark chapter 5, verses 21 through 43. Let's see. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came out. When he saw him, fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, so that she may be made well and live. So Jesus went with him. And a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for twelve years. She had endured much under many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, If I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately her hemorrhage stopped and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say, Who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it, but the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him, and told him the whole truth. Jesus said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace, and be healed of your disease. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he had entered, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then Jesus put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, get up. And immediately the little girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. At this, they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. And back to our psalm, Psalm 32. Happy are those whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Happy are those to whom the Lord imputes no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. While I kept silence, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of the summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not hide my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. 
Therefore, let all who are faithful offer prayer to you. At a time of distress, the rush of mighty waters shall not reach them. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with glad cries of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Do not be like a horse or a mule without understanding, whose temper must be curbed by, with bit and bridle, else it will not stay near you. Many are the torments of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds those who trust in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. And our final psalm today is Psalm 139. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all of my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O oh Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light around me become night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance, in your book were written all the days that were formed for me, when none of them as yet existed. How weighty to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! I try to count them. They are more than the sand. I come to the end. I am still with you. Oh, that you would kill the wicked, O God, and that the bloodthirsty would depart from me. Those who speak of you maliciously and lift themselves up against you for evil, do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. These are the words of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Oh gosh, Psalm 139. It's almost like you just want to sit and just kind of rest in it and reflect right. on it. Um, you know, just the uh, it's so familiar to all of us. We did portions of it for our call to worship on Sunday. Uh, the you, know, you think about some of the increasing amount of, of confusion or gender dis, uh, dysmorphia and all the. Uh, stuff that's going on out in the world and you think about how God is intimately engaged in our creation and right. how he is um, here the psalmist describes it as the Lord who is knitting us together you know we think about biology we think about you know uh, blastospheres turning into you know right. Venus and all these kind of things and then uh, and you know and that's true and that kind of works that way from a from a Medical from a medical, uh, scientific understanding, but just this idea that God knows who we are, God made us as we are, and God has a plan for us, and the uh, that strange mix of just comfort and possibly terror, that there's nowhere you can go, one, to get away from God's blessings, so great, his blessings are there, but then right. the justice that he requires, and... Um, that he you knows our very thoughts. Right, Even right. when they're unspoken. Even when they're unspoken. 
Yes, uh, and so uh, this this praise of God that gets kind of concluded with that, uh, starting in verse 19, oh, that you would kill the wicked, oh God, but then even search me and know my heart and know if there's any, uh, know my thoughts and take the wickedness away, lead me in the way everlasting. I think the psalmist is recognizing that tension um, how easy it is for call down judgment upon those with whom we disagree and desire total mercy for ourselves. But God is one who does both perfectly. Hmm. So I thought, you know, starting with Psalm uh, 139, and then we can get into a little bit of those other texts. Right. You know, if we want to jump back to the Samuel passage, which is okay. probably a good one to start with. Um, Saul, King Saul, and three of his sons anyway that were out in war against the Philistines. Um, it's interesting how uh, at the beginning of kind of this cycle where David is introduced to Saul, David is coming when Saul and his sons are engaged in a battle against David the Goliath, uh, Goliath, yeah, David and yeah, yeah, David and Goliath. Goliath of Gath, the, the big giant guy, um, and and there's this, uh, and David obviously defeats Goliath, and uh, the taunt had been that if you know we engage in singular combat, whoever wins will rule over the other one. Right. Obviously, David and the Israelites win the day through God's power and that. And now here at the end of this particular cycle, we have Saul again fighting against the Philistines, but because he does not have, you know, the Lord's anointed David with him, right. now Saul and his sons fall. And even that line in there, now the Philistines came and took and occupied the towns and the fields that the Israelites left, and that was all that tension. So. So we talk about the blessings that God has available, and we talk about the judgments that God has available. Saul has now experienced both. He had received blessings and rejected them, right. and now he is suffering uh, the consequences to his actions, as, as God said would happen, that as David, right. um, as Saul became unfaithful and persecuted David and all those things, that God would take the kingdom from Saul and then give it to David. So. Uh, tough aspect of scripture. It's right. it's in there. Uh, it's probably good to uh, talk about what happens at the beginning of this was the end of the book of First Samuel at the beginning of Second Samuel when David hears about the death of Saul and Jonathan and others. He doesn't rejoice that his enemies are now dead. He actually mourns their loss. Right. Uh, he mourns what it means for the Lord's anointed to fall. Um, and it's just a good reminder to all of us, you know, that, um, that the mercy that God extends to us, we should be praying for mercy for others um, right. because we received it um, by his generous hand, um, not well, by any work of our own, right. but by the good stuff that he's done. Well, we have David who has now been anointed and Saul has fallen from favor. Saul was in that position of favor. Right. He was. And so I think... You know, that's, David is now in that position. What do you do with it? Mm -hmm. And um, I think there's, there was responsibility. There was call there to Saul, obviously, like you said, and faithful. And so it's, it's easy, not easy. I don't know. It's, it's there just because you get that favor. It's not like, okay, done now. You can do whatever. There is still call there is still responsibility and David has then now been anointed but that is responsibility right that's right and and I think that's one of the things and in initially even when David assumes the throne um, that understanding of it's it's God who is merciful therefore as a king David himself must be merciful right we, we see how that has a problem later on in David's life, but right. I think it's a good indicator. I think you're exactly right. A good indicator that even back in the Old Testament, that God was calling people to be transformed in character. Mm -hmm. What is God like? How can we be 
not God, but how can we be like God? You know, and there is that temptation. If you if you try to act as if you are God and do whatever the heck you want to do, then you, like Saul, end up falling. There are consequences. There are consequences. But if we are transformed increasingly into the image of God or the restored image of God, not mm -hmm. uh, where, where sin is being wiped away, restored more into the image of God, then we start to act more as God would act, mercifully, right. justly, but uh, humbly, recognizing right. that it is right, you know, what, what, yeah, Micah 6, 8, right, you know, what does the Lord require of you? Um, yeah, anything else on that, or do you want to see how it links to some of these other passages? Let's see where we go. Right. How about we how about we look at the Acts passage next? Uh, Acts 15, the council in Jerusalem. This is following after uh, Peter had ministered into the house of Cornelius and Joppa, and Cornelius being a Gentile, a Roman centurion. Paul and Barnabas are out doing ministry, and the Holy Spirit is coming upon Gentiles. That that the message of Christ. Um, yes, many Jews still are converting and following Jesus, but now it's more going out to the Gentiles. And the council in Jerusalem, they're like, um, what's going on here? You know, do Gentiles have to become Jewish first in order to become Christians? And the argument is um, the Holy Spirit came upon Cornelius and his family just as the Holy Spirit came upon us at Pentecost. So yes, the Spirit comes upon Jews, and now yes, the Spirit is coming upon Gentiles. Right. And they had not yet changed their behavior. Right. They had not yet changed their customs. They had not yet been circumcised. They haven't had any of the external characteristics of being Jewish, but what they had was that internal right. heart conversion uh, made possible through the Holy Spirit, uh, the, the message of Jesus Christ and His grace uh, empowered that way. So the Jerusalem Council, well, what are, what are we going to ask them to do? How does this work? And I can't even imagine the tension that would create, you know, people that had been set apart right. from each other for so long. Now God is saying, no, the point all along was that you guys would be reconciled and brought together under his under his lordship. It's a lot. Right. It's a and, lot to deal with. Right. And the fact that they're having this discussion, like what are we supposed to do as if it's somehow their news or their, um, if it's their news to share, like where are the boundaries? Who do we allow in? And I think right. that's where we take that message and we can apply that to us is sometimes that um, just recognizing that the gospel is for all. Mm. And we don't always see, we can't see what's going on inside. And the Spirit does that work and that's not the work of us, that's the work of the Spirit. And, and just recognizing that, that um, God calls, and, and it may not always be who we think it should be, or right. that it, um, yeah, that just that we aren't the gatekeepers of that. Well, we aren't the gatekeepers, right? And, and even the gates that we might set up are antithetical to what God's trying to do. Right. How often do we, even today, we want... Um, we want to hang out with people who look like us and sound like us and uh, have our same political beliefs. And, you know, we just want to be with people that we like. It's easy to be with people because that affirm yeah, what we believe. It's right. easy to be with those people because, well, then, of course I'm right. Right, right. Of course I'm correct. We all enjoy living in our own echo chambers, our own bubbles, you know, our own, you know, maybe even especially in San Angelo. I don't know about the town in which you all live, but um, it's kind of a small place. A right. lot of people kind of know each other for good and for bad, you know. Uh, even families have known each other for good and for You would know this better yes. than I do, because uh, I've only been here for 10 years. Years, but um, there are certainly groups of people that are groups of people and have been groups of people 
for a long time and maybe even the past for good reason, right. you know, but here's where the love of Christ is different than the world does. And if, if God is reconciling Jews and Gentiles, you know, people who would like oil and water, you know, there were groups right. of Jews that didn't get along and there were groups of Gentiles that didn't get along, but Jews and Gentiles. What they liked less than each other was. <laughs> right, right, right. And so that crossing of that barrier mm -hmm. um, is, is huge. And again, they, the Jerusalem Council recognized it as a prophetic statement and said, oh, well, the light's supposed to be for the Gentiles also? Well, wait, well then, okay. Like, how have we missed this before? But how regularly we as humans, even living today, do exactly the same thing right. that uh, needed to be overcome during this council. So, hmm. That's a bit convicting, isn't it? Right. Well, at least it should be convicting. Really? Should it? Oh, I don't know. Like, but but again, if you or I, like if we, if we work on it harder, does it get better? Or do we need Jesus in the mix of it? You know, that's kind of the whole, I think that's the point. Is that right? That we have to have him. We have to have Jesus because... Uh, otherwise, why do it in the first place? Right. right. But ultimately, so, if you're not doing it, the question is, do you have Jesus in the first place? Because if that is the goal... If our focus is on Christ and our focus is on becoming more Christ-like and being faithful and being obedient, hmm. we care for people. Right. Period. Period. Not people that fill in the blank. It's right. we care for people. Right. We love people. Right. And so I think you've got to be careful. And if you're having a really hard time with people, I think that that should be a little bit of a hard check there. Um, right. And so... Hmm. I think that probably applies to all of us, right? Oh, it because... totally, totally applies to me. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, it's... So, so the uh, Mark chapter 5 passage, mm -hmm. obviously uh, Jesus is continuing to teach crowds of people by the sea, and he's approached by a synagogue, do a synagogue ruler whose daughter is dying. Um, but then the... The woman who had had the hemorrhage, the uh, woman who had, would have been for 12 years then un, uh, ceremonially unclean, uh, how would it be possible for her to be in you know normal uh, family relationships? Those kind of things, probably an outcast, probably lonely, right. certainly unclean. Uh, hears about Jesus, reaches out to touch him. Uh, Jesus says, your faith is made well, but I guess Jesus taking the time to deal specifically with a woman that nobody else would have had time for. Right. She'd spent all her money. She wasn't getting any better. There's nothing more we can do for you. Go Done. away. And Jesus takes time to talk with her and be with her um, and, and ultimately lets then the daughter of the, uh, of the synagogue ruler die. Right. Like his urgency is different than our urgency. Right. He takes the time to be with someone that we don't have time for. Right. Well, and even that, and I'm, I'm not sure, I may say this and it may not, I don't know, we'll see how this comes out. Even like she, she comes up behind him and she just reaches out to touch that garment like, she doesn't want to be a bother, but yet she recognizes this immense power. If I can just touch his clothing, not even him. Like, I don't even have to touch him. I just have to touch a piece of cloth that is on him. And if I can do, I mean, like, that is incredible faith, number one. But two, like, we have people that come, the synagogue leader comes to Jesus and says, I need, help me. And we, and we have people all through scripture that are right there in his face Asking, I mean, we go, we intercede for people. We also pray for ourselves. She wasn't even doing that. Like, I don't want to bother him. I'm not, I, I'm not important enough. I, I don't know if I'm reading too much into that, but I don't even have yeah. to bother him. All I have to do is just touch his clothing and that's it. 
and he stops and he's you are a value you are important you are worthy all of those things and she didn't even look at herself as those things mm. she just I mean I can't imagine that she would not have been desperate for something she'd spent all of her money like you said she'd done everything she was supposed to do everything she could do and yet here she is still surely an outcast lonely all of those things so I don't want to be a bother but in this desperate hope and this faith that if I can just do that then then I can I can be right. made whole I can be healed and in all of that he says no you are you are a value and you are worthy and he gives her that mm -hmm. when everyone else would have just dismissed right. her if not been just outright angry with her right like, who do you think you are right so there is a there is a contrast I think that Jesus himself demonstrates right there with what you were saying he he is being followed by a large crowd and they're pressing in on him you know he's got rock star status right, right. You know, he's got the crowd and the crowd is with him and they're let's go see the next awesome thing that Jesus does mm -hmm. and Jesus then doesn't uh, marvel in that he rejoices in the faith of a, of a humble outcast woman Right. And then with that, Jesus then shows that he's not really interested in being the rock star status anyway. The girl is dead, dismisses the paid performer mourners, only has the parents and the three disciples come, and then heals, raises her from the dead, and then says, don't talk about it. Right. And so I wonder, you know, here Jesus is demonstrating, I think, precisely what you were talking about. It's we, you know, the 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 attention seeking, mm -hmm. the the putting yourself out there, the, the the being important. You know, I'm an important person. You know, do people know who I am? You know, how dare you cut me off in traffic? Do you know who I am? I've got important right. things to do. And Jesus is like, no. Do the things that God wants you to do, but do it in a way that will give God glory and, and not yourself. Don't be all thinking about yourself all the time. You know, don't, you know, that, right. is, that, is, that, yes. is that sort of what you were saying? Did I'm totally seeing yes. it. Did the crowd even realize the miracle that he had performed? Right. Did they even recognize they are following him because of this? So it's like you're figuring stuff out, I'm figuring stuff out if you're talking. Right, right. He's got this rock star status. Like, let's go see what, let's go see what he's going to do next this miracle worker um and he did it mm -hmm. right there in front of them did they even know did right. they even recognize um they they're looking they are looking did they even see it or mm -hmm. did they miss it because even that did they even that rock star status that they were giving him he did something that I don't think they would have, they wouldn't have given her a second thought. So did they even recognize the miracle? Wow. They're looking for it, but did they even recognize it right in front of them? I don't know the answer to that. Right. I don't know what to do with that, but right. did they even recognize what he had done? And yes, he did. He dismissed all of those and he does this and do not talk about it. That, I mean, he healed. He, he rose, rose, he raised, raised, raised her from the dead, right? And did they even, recognize the miracle in in the small moments like it wasn't some big grand narrative some big grand it wasn't those people's lives right but for the crowds um do they even realize that you know they're following him but do they even realize that it is in that every day that he was performing those miracles right um right um Gosh, that really kind of wants me to full circle back to the Psalm uh, 139. Just, um, or well, yeah, well, Psalm 139, well, all of the Psalms that we've been doing a lot recently, uh, right. but certainly Psalm 139 in, in God being the one who, who creates everything. Um, but, uh, you know, you had read Psalm 32 mm -hmm. and how that uh, that idea about happy is forgiveness and how 
how God meets us in our needs and delivers us during times of distress. Uh, you know, don't be without understanding, but you know, stay close to Jesus. Just, um, I'm, th I'm thinking about how uh, God continues, like, I, no, it's fascinating what you said. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm processing. That's okay. But how God continues to keep life within us keep life within everybody in the entire world while he's paying attention to one way. Like, you know, yes, Precise Jesus. It's like, yes, Jesus is in flesh and at one place and at one time, but God is sustaining all of his creation all mm -hmm. around the world. And that question that you asked, did they even see his miracle? Do we even see our daily miracles every day where we have a functioning body, even if wasting away a little bit, you know, even if in distress, do we not recognize that every breath that we take is a gift from God and every human on earth that is taking a breath is getting a gift from God? And do we see it? Right. Do we acknowledge it? Do we worship him because of it? And, uh, wow. I don't know. I think just what you said resonated with me in that regard. So thank you. You're welcome. Hmm. Well, we've gone a little long today, I think. Sure but you got something that you, you got something that you want to. No, I, like, and I don't even know end. that saying anything else. I'm just looking back at that Psalm 32, and and it's funny how you know we read them, and sometimes it really just strikes me, and I just hold on to it the whole time. And and I read it today. It wasn't honestly particularly striking to me the first time that I read it, but I'm wasting away. Your hand, I'm groaning, your hand is heavy upon me, my strength is dried up. And in that acknowledgement of sin, in that confession, in that recognition, in that humility, crying out to God, and that forgiveness of sin is offered, and you become a hiding place for me, and you preserve me, and you surround me. like. It doesn't get any better than that. <laughs> it really doesn't. And so... Well, then maybe we should just sit in maybe. silence. <laughs> I don't know. It, uh, yeah. Hmm. Well, do you want to close us in prayer? I would be happy to. Great. Gracious Lord, thank you for your words to us today. Thank you for your love and your compassion and... Uh, that we are surrounded by you and that your hand is upon us and that we can rejoice in the freedom that you give to us through our humility and um, I just pray that we open our hearts to you we we do declare and that we do ask that you take any of that evil and that wickedness that is within us and that you do cleanse us from that and that our hearts are transformed and that we can become more like Christ and that as we uh, go through our daily lives that we look around and that we see you and we feel your presence and that those miracles are revealed to us and that as that happens and we become more Christ-like, that we can love those around us in a way that you call us to do, that we can only do through you and with you. And in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. Hope you have a blessed day. Take care. Bye-bye.